For me, the biggest leap of faith was saying goodbye to my friends, family, comfort, the full-time job offer, all of it, and just saying, I'm gonna follow my heart and moved to LA to pursue acting. The next one for me was when I had the spiritual awakening. I went and told my acting manager and agents and I said, I am no longer willing to audition. It effectively ended my acting career. That led to just pure desperation of, I will do anything. What do I need to do? How do I figure this out? We went on the road. We just launched our coaching businesses and we've only ever lived in LA. We have no social media following. So how are you gonna start a business halfway around the world? But we just trust it. And really that leap of faith from moving out to pursue acting to that moment of saying, I have no idea how I'm gonna pay my anything next month. I'm gonna give up my personal training business. I'm gonna give away my items and I'm going on the road here. And the rest is kind of history, man. I just started sharing the journey along the way and that ultimately would lead to all of the social media and podcasts and all of the things. I moved to Los Angeles. I lived in my aunt and uncle's garage. Oh, behind, behind your house there. That behind garage. the washer and dryer. They, though they had a, they had a, uh, this like garage in the back that they'd converted to, to have like a bathroom in it and, um, a little like area that I just called home. And, uh, the, I worked in a restaurant when I first got there. Um, and I was alone. I didn't have any friends. I didn't know anyone. And I wasn't in LA where you go out. I was, um, out in El Monte, California. Um, and, and that just sounds far, far away. Yeah, man, it was, it was far. And I, I did professional, uh, professional theater play all the way in San Pedro, which was like a two hour drive to get there each way. And I would drive to right. rehearsals and then drive back. And like, it was the grind. It was the struggle. And I had this belief deep down that the cream rises to the top, right? So I am just going to be the best I possibly can. And I took that work ethic um, to give you an idea of how my mindset worked. I, I had a job at an ad agency. I was a paid uh, intern that was offered a full-time job when I graduated college. And mm -hmm. I said no in order to start s serving at an Italian restaurant and then bartending at this Italian restaurant just so I could have bartending serving experience for when I moved to Los Angeles and figured I would have to be a waiter and wanted, like, I still had that mindset of how do I do this to in, set myself up for success? How do I do this really well? Um, and I took that approach to acting, but it, there's so much more than just talent that goes into acting in the acting world and, and building a career there. And ultimately years in, um, it was, I had been humbled so deeply. I'd been beaten up so badly during, from that industry that it led me to my spiritual awakening. Cause they say where the, the cracks are, where the light gets in. I had had so much success at an early age in so many different things that I thought I had life figured out and acting was the great equalizer for me to go, you might not have this thing figured out. And that led to just pure desperation of, I, I will do anything. What do I need to do? How do I figure this out? And ultimately that would lead me to ayahuasca and, and a spiritual awakening and set me on the path I'm on now. Yeah. A couple of thoughts. Um, um, you know, I used to be in the modeling industry in New York city. I worked at a restaurant made pretty decent money working at that restaurant. And I ended up being fortunate enough to book, um, an advertising campaign with, uh, the gap. And I remember one day I was waiting tables and I saw my face on a side of a bus and I was like, oh my God, this is actually happening. But I still, that, that campaign didn't really pay a whole lot of money. And I thought to myself, this is it. This is my time i have to take this leap of faith away from the safety of the restaurant job and into this unknown of you know i don't know what's going to happen but hope i'm hoping for the best did you have a moment where you uh you pulled the plug you hit the eject button on the 
comfort of your bartending and the restaurants and all of that, and you, you took the leap of faith? Yeah. I mean, I think that for me, the, the biggest leap of faith was saying no, saying goodbye to my friends, family, comfort, the full-time job offer, um, mm -hmm. all of it. And just saying, I'm going to follow my heart and move right. to LA, to, move to LA to pursue acting at all. That to me, like I had such close friends. I have none of them now. None of my hmm. friends that I had pre spiritual awakening are in my life now. And I, I felt that risk even then, like what happens if I move away from, from all of these people? What happens if I move away from my family? Um, how, what about wasting time? Here I am, one of the most promising young employees in this ad agency and know that I would crush this. I, I, I have a bright career ahead of me here if I want to move into advertising and to say no to all of that and go and live in my aunt and uncle's garage to pursue an acting career was the first time in my life that I made a decision that didn't make logical sense, but mm -hmm. was what my heart was calling me towards. And that set in motion really a foundational belief that that's more important than anything. And mm -hmm. so from that moment forward, I've been following my heart. And there, it's sometimes it takes a little longer for me to figure out what my heart is calling for. Uh, but I think that was the, the, the real big moment of that. And the next one for me was when I had the spiritual awakening and I said, I am unwilling to put my energy into anything that perpetuates fear on this planet. I, I can't do it. And so I went and told my act, my acting manager and agents. And I said, I am no longer willing to audition for CSI or mm. horror, any horror films or fact or like uh, fast food commercials with factory farmed stuff. I'm just not willing to do any of these things anymore, which is 90% of everything that you at the, that goes out in Hollywood, especially in those early stages of building a career. And so it effectively ended my acting career. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. What was your first exposure to poetry? Huh. I was actually in Santa Monica at an event um, called Fred Talks. Fred Talks. Oh, yeah. yeah. With, uh, with uh, Steve. Yeah. At his house. At his house. I was probably there, man. What Really? Do you remember what year that was? Yeah. I used to live right around the corner from Steve and would go to his Fred Talks on occasion. Yeah. I don't know. I would say, God. if I had to guess, I would say probably around... 2016. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I went to one of his Fred Talks events. And at these events, everyone, there's a bunch of speakers. They all get five minutes, basically. Um, uh. And the last person to go was a spoken word poet. And I don't know how, but I had never heard spoken word poetry before. I, as soon as he started performing, there was like this light that went off in, in my head, lightning bolt. And I just said, I can do that. I can do that. And I went home that night and I wrote my first spoken word piece. And then I went, I went, I, I shared it with some friends the next day. And I said, Hey, I just did this thing. I think it's pretty good. And I read it to them and one, they said, that's really good. Cool. And then the next that my friend who was listening said, your next one should be called You Are Who You've Been Looking For. Okay. And I went home and in 48 hours, I wrote my second ever piece, which is You Are Who You've Been Looking For, which is the poem that years later would go on to be viewed more than 200 million times. It's, it went so viral and it launched my career in a lot of ways publicly. Um, and it was the second piece I ever wrote. And it was because my friend gave me the title. Do you remember who the poet was at the Fred talk that you got inspired by? Uh, 
I'll have to look up his name. It definitely wasn't like in Q or anybody like that. It, it, was, was it wasn't in Q. It, it's Someone a white else. dude. It's a white dude. Um, but he, and he's done some really great ones. I'll have to find it. I think it's Steve. Some, is it not Steve? Steve's the name of the, yeah, Oops. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look it up because I want to give okay. him credit for inspiring me for sure. All right. So um, at this point, you're, you obviously, you know, memorize monologues and stuff in your acting career. So that was just kind of a part of the whole deal. So when you, when you started identifying as a spoken word poet, was that part of the process? You already kind of had all that locked into place. Like I write this thing and memorize it. Or I say it, I use the art of tonality and uh, presence and emotion behind it. And so did you find that that was one of the reasons why you were more of, or you came off as more of a natural than maybe your average person who decides I'm going to be a spoken word poet? I'd like to think so. I'd like to think that that's part of the reason why people uh, appreciate my delivery of any kind of content, including this podcast. I, I uh -huh. feel a, what a lot of people, because we're in an era of anyone with a social media page is, is can voice their opinions and put out, talk into their phone and put out videos and regurgitate information that they read in a book about the four agreements or whatever. And I, I don't, I, I have such a version to being put in that category. And I know a lot of people who they've, they've come to follow me over the years may have, may not be aware of this, but I take a lot of pride in the fact that I spent over a decade of my life professionally training as a performer and as a writer and as an actor. I mean, I've written feature length films and web series and directed music videos. There's a whole background of storytelling and performance that uh, was a huge part of my life. It, it was my first love. And so I bring a lot of that into how I speak and how I perform definitely. And the process of spoken word poetry is is very much storytelling to me. It's it's like write. Let me sit down and write a short film. Great, awesome, or a scene. Um, writing poetry is the same way. And then you memorize it, and then as you're memorizing it, you notice where certain emotion wants to rise up, where it is. Every time you deliver it, gets to be different. A lot of times, you get poets that say their poems the same way every single time. Well, my background as a in theater, you got to do the same play a hundred times from rehearsals to actually performances. How do you keep that fresh? How do you keep that new? Um, that's actually a skill that, that a lot of actors have to learn and struggle with. How do you keep something new when you're saying it for the hundredth time? And, um, so all of that carried over into the, the spoken word poetry realm. And I see, I see it as spoken word poetry, bringing together my, my study of personal development and, and my life coaching, quote unquote, coaching business, whatever. And all of the things that I was teaching, but done in an artistic way, which I think brings in a whole other element that makes it more powerful and actually can shift people a lot more quickly and more deeply when they receive it as art, as opposed to feeling like they're listening to a logical lecture. Well, you also had that sort of eight month long vision quest where you went all around the world and, um, you know, you sold off all your stuff, you went home free and that, that probably I'm imagining it contributed to your openness and to the things that you wanted to express and maybe your, the development of your insight around these topics that really landed and hit home. You're for, doing uh, research, bro. What is for, this? For, 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 Tim yeah. Ferriss over here. You really got this research done. I love this. Wow, this is impressive. Um, so I was in a partnership uh, at the time and we had gone through a spiritual awakening and we were watching, you got to give credit to Ty Lopez of all people. Um, <laughs> when my, my spiritual awakening looked like um, pre-spiritual awakening, I would... I was personal training and acting and I would come home from personal training day. I would smoke some weed and me and my partner would like eat and watch Grey's Anatomy or Lost or whatever. Just go Netflix binging for hours. Those weed shows. Absolutely. Much, totally. You don't know how Golden good Grey's Girls. Anatomy is until you're right. fine. And so 
And then um, once after post awakening, it was very similar. I went to personal training and acting, and then I would come home and I would smoke weed with my partner. We'd eat and we would watch spiritual YouTube videos and we would watch personal development videos. Matt Kahn, Teal Swan, uh, like, like all kinds of stuff and spirit science and all of it. And then what we would pause things and we would talk about them. And I had this partner that I was learning with. It was like we were in school together. And in one of the videos, Ty Lopez's Lamborghini garage ad mm -hmm. comes up and the thing's like 15 minutes long. And we're just watching it probably because we're just too stoned to change anything. And we're just, well, this is interesting. And then it was click here to get the next webinar thing. So we click there and we're watching it. And he says, you're the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with. And he invited us to make a list of those five people. And, and we realized, wow, we don't have anyone that we are looking to for guidance or mentorship. We just entered into this new chapter of spirituality and there was, there were no guides for us. And that was a huge aha moment. And we ended up deciding to take action on that. And, th and this is what's important for everyone to understand is just because you could become aware of something, if you don't take action on it, nothing's going to change. Mm -hmm. And so we took the action to go to a retreat in Costa Rica. And um, at this re personal development retreat, we'd never been to anything like it. And we'd never been to Costa Rica before. And while we were there, we ran into two facilitators who are friends of yours and mine, Preston Smiles and Alexi Finn. Mm -hmm. And they were facilitating at, they were facilitators at this retreat. And they were really just starting you know, their coaching careers and um, have gone on to make massive impact in our epic humans. And we just vibed, you know, we just became really fast friends. And um, we all lived in LA. So once we got back to LA, we just started hanging out and whatever. And, um, you know, fast forward to I'm a groomsman in, in Preston's wedding. And, and we, you and I get to meet in uh, Tulum, right? That's where we got to meet. And, um, they invited my partner and I at the time to go on tour with them to Australia, where they were going to be facilitating some workshops. And they said, we'd love to have you come and facilitate with us and be support facilitators. And we just said, okay, yeah, let's do that. And that looked like giving away 75 to 80% of everything we owned, literally just put posting on social media, come get free stuff. We post on Craigslist. We just put it out in the back, come and take whatever you want. And I'm talking a snowboard, snowboard boot, like just gave it all away, man. And, um, the only thing we kept was like a couch and the TV and, and, you know, bigger furniture items. And we went on the road and we went on the road and everyone thought we were crazy because we just launched our coaching businesses and we've only ever lived in LA. That's who knows us. We have no social media following. So how are you going to start a business halfway around the world? Um, but we just trusted and really that's that leap of faith from moving out to pursue acting to that moment of saying, you know what, even though it doesn't make sense and I have no idea how I'm going to pay my anything next month, I'm going to give up my personal training business. I'm going to get, I'm going to give away my items and I'm going on the road here. And the rest is kind of history, man. Just sharing the journey. I was just, I just started sharing the journey along the way. And that ultimately would lead to all of the social media and podcasts and, and all of the things. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.